average global penetration rate for the insurance market is at 7.5%, with England as the global leader at 16.5%. South Africa leads the African continent with a 16% penetration rate. Now, despite these penetration rates, Africa has contributed significantly to the insurance industry growth, yet there is huge growth potential for further growth. Joining us for a look at the insurance sector is Risto Katola, insurance analyst at SBG Securities. Now, interestingly enough, on Hot Stocks this evening, we are also discussing the insurance sector, and uh, we look at these companies as relatively pedestrian, boring investment entities, have you got a different view to share with us? That's quite a good description. Um, I think it's very popular nowadays. So I just spent two weeks in, in the US um, seeing clients and so on. And first time in my life, I'm actually talking down people's expectations and valuations of insurance. So, you know, eight of the 10 years I've been doing this, I've been telling people it's not that bad. Now people are getting excited about insurance, maybe too much so. But the fact that they're very stable companies, very good dividend yields, they recognize as defensive companies, uh, non-South African, African countries add a bit of a growth angle. Yeah, so they're, they're boring, but I think boring and steady and good dividends in this environment is still quite an attractive uh, stock. Yeah, boring and steady and decent cash flow speaks mm. to almost a bond-like structure. And is, is that really what they're looking for with some semblance of growth? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember a few years ago trying to argue that, you know, you look at the dividend yields on life insurance companies, it tends to be double the inflation-linked bond yield. So you know, and, they, and, and they have been able to increase their dividend in line with inflation over long periods of time. So it's like getting two inflation-linked bonds for the price of one. Now, it's a good sales pitch, particularly in an environment where people want yield. Um, I think the important thing is people realize that these insurance companies can change and respond to competition and change. So if we think back maybe six, seven years ago, you know, a lot of negative press around these companies. The products are outdated. You know, trust companies are going to kill them. They can't change the way they do business, the way they sell, and, they, and they're showing them wrong. I mean, these companies haven't just rolled over and shrunk. They have continued to grow in line with the economy. They're not shooting the, the lights out, but they're certainly doing better than people expected. Well, look at Sunlam. We, we now are trading at a premium to embedded value, and uh, there's potential for aggressive growth into emerging markets. How do you view Sunlam as an investment case right now? Sunlam is quite expensive. Uh, we do have a sell recommendation on it. Um, I mean, there's, there's not a huge amount of value in the market in general if, if, if I look around, unless you're prepared to go into resources. Um, Sunlum, the rating is about 1,1 times EV, which is pretty much all-time highs for that particular company. If you're looking at forward PE ratings, it's trading in the low teens. I mean, I think it's probably similar PE to first round, and you have to wonder which is the more exciting of the companies purely on that basis. The, also, the, the, the emerging market angle on Sunlum is maybe a little bit overplayed. So they have an African business which accounts for about, mental maths here, about 8% of my valuation. So don't get too excited about it in other yeah, words. Yeah, I mean, they, they're investing another $2 billion in India, or they have recently. Um, I was just reviewing some of my notes from management meetings yesterday, and I think they've got another $3 billion rand lined up in East Asia and India over the next few years. So over time, emerging markets will become a larger component. But you must remember, it's still largely a South African retail life insurance business with asset management added onto it. The fact that it trades on such a different multiple to its domestic peer group is very surprising. Mr. I mean, wh one of the things with these companies are that, you know, like you say, now they're looking quite extended in terms of, of a multiple of their, of their EVs, but there's also some inherent link in terms of general market performance and then the performance of the, of the insurers. And now we've had a fairly strong domestic market. It's been running on, let's call it that industrial sector with a large retail component. And there's been a bit of a beta disconnect between, you know, the market and the underlying economy where the, the outlook for the economy is fairly poor, but the market continues to run. How do you see that playing out and then the knock-on effect, for example, on, on, on your insurers and then just the market in general? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very tricky question, but I think important answer to that is that insurance companies are largely domestic businesses, okay? So I was I had a meeting this morning with our chief economist in Standard Bank, and he was telling the crowd about the fact that your domestic factors in economic growth are actually quite good. What's hurting overall GDP growth is our export and trading stuff. So the domestic side of the economy is quite strong. And insurance companies, like local retailers, are largely SA domestic businesses. Um, so I think that's why insurance companies and other domestic companies have continued to do well. Uh, I mean, the other thing I must say that if I look at the results of life companies in terms of operating profit, if I look at some of the retailers, I look at Able the other day, I mean, we keep on being worried. 
but domestic focused companies keep surprising us. You know, maybe we're confusing weak global economy and trading pa patterns too much with the domestic economy. So it it's, it's a hard question to answer, but I think that answers part of it. Life companies are SA companies. They're not exporters. They don't, they don't operate globally, except mutual. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, Risto, we, I take your point, but you know, middle class is coming under increasing pressure when one looks at their, their debt ratios. Um, what do you think is going to make insurance products attractive? Because if you look at the products 10 years ago, yes, there has been a change, but are these companies changing quickly enough to, ad to adapt to the consumer? Your, your, your sort of pure middle class is probably the toughest area. So, I mean, if I'll come back to that now, but if I look at the high net worth market, a lot of the life companies have launched quite interesting investment products where they use their balance sheet, they use the fact they can invest more exotic instruments than some of the other guys. And, and, and high net worth individuals are a little bit scared of the market. So high net worth are doing well. Entry level we've spoken about a lot. So public sector, funeral plans, some simple savings products doing well. Middle market is tricky. So that's probably the weakest area of growth uh, for insurance companies like for a lot of other uh, parts of the economy. Um, the one thing I must defend the life companies though is the persistency of life products even in that market is surprisingly good. So again, when you were insurance analyst, uh, I remember the, the general perception was when times get tough, your insurance policy is the first one to go. That hasn't happened. You know, I, th I think people value that or that they, they realize I cannot cancel the insurance policy because if something happens the next two months, my family is left in real trouble. So, so insurance policy is actually quite high up the order of importance in the middle income families payments. Yeah. But part of the problem 12 years ago was the fact that people had five or six policies mm. from, you know, Sunna Mutual, yeah. back then African Life. So and and dicey to get pricing. Sorry? And dicey pricing. Well, the, look, <laughs> there was a lot of fees. Less generous that. than now. Yeah. Yeah. Less generous pricing, absolutely. So Just Risto, one, we're we running out of time, a quick sure. one. If you were to make a pick in the insurance sector in terms of, of which stock to invest in, is it Old Mutual, which is at the biggest discount to embedded value? It still is. It's been our preferred stock for about two years, continues to be so. It still trades on very much similar multiples to its developed market peers even though the businesses continue to become more and more of an emerging market story. So they've been shedding European and US assets and bulking up in Latin America and Africa. And the rating is just simply too low in, in light of the prospects for that business. 